Heavenly Father, we long for that day when our faith is turned to sight, when prayer is turned to praise, when we will be in your very presence, when sin will be gone and every tear wiped away, when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, the first things will have passed away. And the first day will lead into the next and the next and the next in an infinite progression of ever-increasing delight in your presence. In the meantime, Lord, we walk by faith. And if our perseverance were left up to us, surely we would have walked away a long time ago. But you are kind, you are gracious, and you keep your promises when we fail at ours. And you will cause us to stand blameless in your presence with great joy. Because you love us, because you have loved us, and you will love us to the end. In your name we glory. In your power we boast. We ask for your help even now as we look at your word, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, your word would be clear and we would be helped. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good for us to be together. It's good for us to sing songs like that. It's good for us to think about persevering to the end. I think about what it means to face down every trial, every temptation that lies before me in this earthly pilgrimage. I get overwhelmed. I know my heart. I know my own tendencies. And I'm thankful for God's promises that transcend my own abilities to walk with him, that he remains faithful, that he will bring everyone who belongs to him to the finish line. This is the perseverance of the saints. And God uses many means to accomplish the perseverance of the saints. God uses mornings like this morning where we're gathered together to encourage one another in song to hear from God's word together, to act like a body of believers together. And one of the means God uses to accomplish our perseverance to the end as believers is what we're going to look at this morning in God's word. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to be looking this morning at Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. And here Jesus outlines a process, a step-by-step process of love and care for one another in the body of Christ. And here are Jesus' instructions to the church. If your brother sins... Go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector." Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered in my name, I am there in their midst." What Jesus outlines here is referred to often as the church discipline process. You'll notice in the bulletin you receive, every four weeks printed in that bulletin is a reminder that we follow Jesus' instructions in this text. And it's helpful from time to time to get a fuller explanation of what's going on there so that you understand why that appears in the bulletin every four weeks and why that is something we desire to keep in front of us regularly as a body of believers. This has been called the Matthew 18 process or the church discipline process. This has been called the pursuit of prodigals. 
which is a particularly good description. If you consider Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, the father's disposition in that parable was one of joy and celebration at the son's return. The father's desire was not the removal from his household of a beloved son, but the recovery of a wayward son, restoration of a son. And this process, this Matthew 18 process, is out of vogue in our day. Uh, Even parental discipline is out of vogue in our day. Tolerance, or a misunderstood definition of the word tolerance, has replaced love. The idea that a church would seek to address harmful behavior among its own members and even remove a person who is unwilling to change seems like an obsolete hangover from the Middle Ages. Many churches are unwilling to follow Jesus' instructions in this matter out of fear that people won't attend a church that actually addresses sin in its people. I remind you of Acts chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, when Ananias and Sapphira were dropped by the Lord in the presence of the church. They had lied to the Holy Spirit. They had deceived people in an attempt to make a name for themselves in view of others. And the testimony of that church was that the church grew as a result. Outsiders, the world was afraid to join them. Who would want to join that group of people if sin was actually addressed? But those who loved the Lord Jesus joined them in droves. The Lord added to their number, the text says, while outsiders feared and held the church in high esteem. How often have you heard this criticism of the church? I would never go to a church that's full of hypocrites. Why don't they clean up their own messes? And yet the world demands that the church clean up its own act. The world that demands that the church clean up its own act is horrified when the church actually follows through on that desire. There are reasons to practice church discipline One is simply love of people, love of people. If if someone is on a heart trajectory away from Christ, how loving is it to tolerate that trajectory which ends in a lake of fire? Real love desires to help people who are on a wayward trajectory away from Christ to make course corrections so that they have Christ. And don't miss eternity with him. Love of people who are asleep in a burning building would demand that we break into the building and pull people out. Another reason to practice church discipline is a desire for restoration, for forgiveness, for unity. Sin breaks relationships and restoration and confession and repentance restores those relationships brings about forgiveness. It brings about unity. You know, in your own personal relationships, when you've sinned against someone, you've broken a relationship, but when you've confessed that sin and that sin's been forgiven, there is a a strengthening of a bond in personal relationships. There is a sweetness and a unity you couldn't have had before. And we desire that in the church. Another reason to practice church discipline is simply the purity of the church. Jesus loves his church, and he loves the purity of the church, and he's given these instructions to the church. A fourth reason to follow church discipline is simply as a command of Jesus. Jesus said to do this. There are consequences of a church not practicing church discipline. One is the bitterness that comes with a lack of confession and a lack of repentance. Bitterness ensues when someone sins against you and nothing is ever done about that. What results are personal vendettas and vengeance. It would be like living in a a human world with no government. Everybody would take governance into his own hands. A church without church discipline would promote and produce licentious living. That is, people will feel feel the freedom or the license to sin without hesitation because sin is never addressed. 
The end result, of course, of not practicing church discipline for those who are wayward is apostasy, the very real New Testament doctrine that someone who walks away from the faith demonstrates themselves to have never been a genuine Christian at all. What a tragedy it is for someone to have sat under the Word of God, to have heard the gospel, to have rehearsed the gospel, sung the gospel, even preached the gospel, even led others to the gospel, and never have had a personal interest in the gospel. And a wayward heart is on display in unaddressed, unconfessed, unrepentant sin. Another result is of not following these directions is that everyone does what is right in his own eyes. It's just sort of a free-for-all. The church results in a loss of witness, a loss of influence. Think about Revelation chapter 2 and the church at Thyatira. They had tolerated immorality. And Jesus let them know that their lampstand could not shine if that continued. The very reason a church exists is to demonstrate what Wayman spoke about this morning, the transforming grace of God in the lives of real people, real sinners like you and me, sinners who have been declared righteous by God, who have been forgiven by God, who still manifest residual depravity. We still sin against each other, but something has changed in us, and when we sin, we seek to forgiveness. We confess and we seek restoration vertically with God and horizontally with each, with each other. And this becomes a community unlike the world, unrecognizable to the world, remarkable before the world, influential in the world. And the main point of this passage is that Jesus gave the church a process by which to pursue wayward Christians. Jesus gave the church a process by which to pursue wayward Christians. We're going to examine the practice of church discipline this morning through the activities of three concerned parties, the church, heaven, and the Lord Jesus himself. We look first at the church's procedure. This is outlined for us in verses 15 through 17. Every student pilot becomes intimately familiar with an emergency checklist, an emergency checklist is a, a, a piece of paper laminated with very simple instructions, and it, and it sits in the door, it sits on your lap, it sits in a pocket, somewhere very handy, somewhere ready at hand that you can grab it if the engine stops. <laughs> if the engine stops in your car, you pull over to the side of the road. If the engine stops in an airplane, uh, that's a different set of problems. And that checklist provides a very simple set of instructions. What to do if the engine stops. If the propeller stops turning, here are the simple procedures. This is a crisis moment. This is a critical moment. And a piece of paper with simple procedures is really helpful. Set the airplane at the right angle for glide to cover the maximum distance to get to a safe place to land. Check your fuel selector and your fuel pump and your ignition switch. Turn it over. Check the key. Prepare the doors. Prepare your passengers. Communicate. <laughs> and these things are laid out for you, even though every student pilot has these procedures memorized. You pull out that checklist and you read them and you follow the instructions because in a critical moment, you don't rely on your memory. You don't wing this. You don't play this by ear. You follow the simple procedures. They're short, clear, simple. This is a serious situation, and it requires simple, clear instructions. It may sound clinical in a, a church setting that is, by nature, relational. It, it might seem impersonal to have these steps to follow, these procedures to follow. But it's actually very helpful in the mind of our Lord Jesus it's very helpful in something like a medical emergency when there is serious trauma. You want your medical emergency responders to follow proven, simple instructions rather than be overwhelmed and unable to help. These simple instructions remove the blindness caused by emotions in a traumatic situation. Following these simple instructions will keep us from making it up as we go. It'll keep people who have been sinned against in the body of Christ from taking revenge or growing in silent bitterness. 
Importantly, this simple process unearths what no human could possibly detect, the hidden condition of a human heart. What, what does a human heart really look like? We, we paint a veneer on the outside of who we are and what we do. How often do we really get to see the, the inner man beating on the outside? And this simple procedure designed by Jesus actually unearths what none of us could detect from the outside. And notice, first of all, these instructions come from Jesus. This is our Lord speaking in Matthew 18. And we can simply dispense with the idea that, well, my Jesus would never do anything like this. Actually, no, this is exactly what Jesus does. This is exactly what Jesus commends to us. This is what Jesus commands. This procedure for the church is actually what Jesus would tell us to do when a brother sins. This is what he has told us to do. And keeping this in mind will bring tremendous comfort when we have to go about the difficult task of addressing sin in each other's lives. Four steps, each with the goal of restoring a straying brother. Private reproof, private conference, public announcement, and public exclusion. Let's look at the first step, private reproof. This is step one laid out for us in verse 15. If your brother sins, Jesus says, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Some English versions of the Bible include the words against you. If your brother sins against you, uh, those words probably should not be in the text. Uh, Jesus later in this passage tells us how to deal with a personal offense. But here in Matthew 18, in this process, this is a sin in general. Um, Peter wants to know, well, what do I do if my brother sins against me again and again and again? And Jesus' response about a personal offense is forgive him again and again and again. Down in verse 21, you can find out more about Jesus' response to a personal offense. But here, no specific sin is specified. In fact, there is no list in Scripture of the types of sin that should be addressed in the church discipline process. Any sin left unchecked is a danger to the Christian and to the church. Unchecked sin hardens the heart, brings disunity, and is on a trajectory toward apostasy, a trajectory of walking away from Christ altogether. Immorality, false teaching, divisiveness, anger, drunkenness, gossip, anything the Bible calls sin, unchecked, unremedied, unconfessed. As we will see, the issue really is the condition of the heart. Is a brother willing to turn from sin or does he desire to cling to sin as that sin is addressed? And notice the, who is addressed here, your brother. This is the responsibility of brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, in the local church. And, and this, for uh, intents and purposes, is a brother, that is a professing brother, someone who on the outside appears to be a Christian, someone who is claiming Christ. And this task of addressing your brother is not just the task of leaders, it is the task of brothers and sisters in Christ. And sin here demonstrates that uh, what Jesus has in mind is not the area of preferences. I don't like what that guy wore today, Matthew 18, step one. No, when your brother sins, we don't address things about each other we just don't like. We address the things that God defines as sin. And, and sins, in a present tense, is the idea of an ongoing Sin, a, a pattern of sin. All of us sin, all, all of us sin, and, and I hope we're on short accounts with God and with each other. A, a sin turned away from, a, a sin confessed and repented of is not in the category here. We're talking about an ongoing pattern of unrepentant sin. That's bound up in this idea of the present tense verb here, if your brother sins. That is a sin he's holding on to and not forsaking. And the instruction is in step one, go and show him his fault. Literally, go and reprove. 
And so the caring brother takes the initiative out of love and compassion and concern. And to reprove is to show someone they're wrong. And there are important features about how we go about doing this. Matthew 7, 5 is instructive. Take the log out of your own eye so you'll be able to clearly see the speck that is in your brother's eye. Right? You don't want a, an eye surgeon with a redwood forest growing out of his face, impeding his ability to do precision surgery on an eyeball. Um, we, we work hard to be on short accounts with God and with each other so that we go with compassionate care and precision in helping our brother. And Galatians 6.1 is helpful. I want you to turn there for just a moment. Galatians 6.1 gives us the disposition or the attitude, the mindset we are to have when we address sin in one another. Paul there instructs the church, brothers, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ being love. This is an aspect of love and the goal is restoration and it is to be done in a spirit of gentleness and it is to be done without hypocrisy, looking to our own hearts, our own selves and it is to be done with a mindset of bearing another's burdens. And the situation called for in Galatians 6.1 begins with if anyone is caught in any trespass. This is not the idea like I came around the corner, I saw my brother in sin and I caught him. Aha, I caught you. No, rather, you're walking through the woods and your brother has been caught in a great big giant steel bear trap and that bear trap has snapped on his legs causing compound fractures and there's blood all over the forest and your brother is moaning in pain. He is caught. That's what caught is. And you, with gentleness and self-examination and compassionate care, go and pry that steel trap open and mend his wounds. You help your brother. This is the mindset with which we go to our brother. And Jesus says we do this in verse 15 in private. In private. And this is so important. This is not to be shared as a church announcement. This is not to be lifted up to others as a prayer request. This is person to person, private confrontation. And Jesus says if he listens... And to listen here is to hear and heed and to give up sin. That's what it means to listen. And if he listens, you have won your brother. You've won your brother. You've gained your brother. This is a victory. The father gets the prodigal son back and he he felt as if he he had gotten his child back from the dead. And this is the goal, restoration. The motive is love. The process is over. The sin is confessed, turned from, and it remains private. The result is rejoicing. I encourage you to read 12 to 14. What does it look like when the one missing sheep is brought back? When the one lost coin is found? When the one prodigal son returns? It's a party. And step one happens all the time in the body of Christ. Well, why don't I hear about it? Because it's private. We don't broadcast these things. Little corrections, we admonish one another, we stay on short accounts, we sin, we recognize it, we confess it and turn. There's someone who loves us, helps us see it, we confess and we turn. It's called parenting. It's called marriage. It's called small group. It's life in the body of Christ. It is discipleship and life together. We all have blind spots. We all have the ability to be hard-hearted and defensive and slow to turn away from sin, and, and we need each other. Step one does not always work. There's no guarantee that if we follow the procedure in step one that the sinning brother will turn, and so Jesus gives us the second step. This is private conference in verse 16. If he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. This now is more than just you going to your brother. The church discipline process cannot be carried out by one person. 
A church leader is not allowed to merely excommunicate an enemy. A Christian is not able to remove someone from fellowship all by himself. And an accusation is not valid simply because it has been made. In fact, we have an example in Scripture of a sinful, self-absorbed man who actually excommunicated people all by himself. Diotrephes in 3 John 9 and 10. And Paul had to, or John had to warn the church about Diotrephes, calling attention to his deeds. He says he is not satisfied with merely accusing the apostles of wickedness. He himself does not receive the brethren, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Right? That is not the biblical process of church discipline, single-handed excommunication. Step two does not necessarily happen immediately following the first attempts at step one either. Think about the last time that someone pointed out something wrong in your life, uh, some course correction that needed to take place, some sin to, to be let go of. How did you respond? <laughs> did you feel like a cat in a corner, claws out, defensive? That's normal. <laughs> It's not right. It's normal. I would would love for my follow-up response to replace my natural first response. But it's helpful for us to remember to expect that someone's first response may not be the enduring one. It may not be the one they wish they would have had given time and prayer. And so step one uh, is not an instantaneous act followed immediately by step two. In many cases, in most cases, step one is more than one conversation. And step two can be more than one conversation. Some sins which threaten others require more speedy procedures, but where we can, we, we love to be slow with each other, patient, deliberate, prayerful, hopeful. And the goal of verse 16, like the goal in verse 15, is restoration. This step two is Jesus' gracious process for the restoration of a sinning brother. Take two or three in addition to yourself. Why? So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And these witnesses don't have to be witnesses to the original offense. They are witnesses to the reproof and the response. This is not a trial in a court of law. This is a protection against false accusations and personal attacks. It's there actually to help defend and protect the one who is accused from someone who would make a wrongful accusation. It's also there to confirm a hard-hearted response to loving rebuke. It's there to demonstrate the heart of the person who will not turn from his sin. And this does not always work either. And Jesus gives a third step in verse 17. This is a public announcement. Jesus says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. And this can be a segment of the church, the group of elders or the small group or a ministry where the individual is involved. It can be the whole church gathered like on a Sunday morning. Often at Grace Bible Church, we practice step three in concentric circles. We, we talk in stages telling it to the church in ever-widening circles with the hope that a man could be restored to fellowship. The one, the few, the church, the, the effect of a widening circle of exposure is the demonstration of a heart attitude in the one who will not forsake sin. The goal of step three is unity and fellowship, but the unrepentant one demonstrates that he would rather cling to his sin than to his spiritual family. Think about that. I love this sin more than I love those who have poured their lives out for me in the body of Christ. He's rejected the loving admonition of the one. He has refused the loving conference of the few. And now the church is informed so that they may collectively pursue him in love. And what is on display in the rejection of this widening circle is a hard heart, the trajectory of apostasy. The writer of Hebrews warns about this, Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. 
But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And hope for the hard-hearted is found in Jesus' instructions here. Perhaps he will listen to the church. And listen, a, a public announcement is, it's hard. It's hard for the church. It's, it's hard for the one about whom an announcement is made. And yet we know from the lips of Jesus here that it is good. It is actually his means to break up hard ground and to accomplish love and unity in the body. And if he does not repent in a third step, then Jesus gives a fourth. Step four is public exclusion. In the second half of verse 17, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Most of us in this room are Gentiles, and some of you might be tax collectors. What does Jesus mean by these phrases, these pejorative terms? They, they sound derogatory. For these Jewish hearers, a Gentile would have been considered an outsider, in their parlance, uh, uh, not a God-fearer, a Gentile who actually loved the God of Israel, but a Gentile who remained outside and cast away from the God of Israel. And a tax collector was an outsider by defection. A tax collector in that first century in Israel was actually a, a Jew who so despised his people that he was a turncoat under the Roman Empire employed by the Romans to extort money shamefully from his own people. A defector, a turncoat, a traitor. And so Jesus lets the church know that one who will not let go of his sin but has effectively removed the church from his own life in successive steps is to be treated as he has asked to be treated. He wants to be an outsider. And he wants to walk away from the church. By the way, this on, on the, at the pen of Matthew, whose occupation was what? A tax collector. Saved by grace. Here's a man who knew what it was like to be rescued. This process is... A command from Jesus. Though painful in what it reveals, it's not optional. And it's actually hopeful. The goal here in step four is restoration. And to treat one as an outsider is not a prohibition of all contact. It is a removal from fellowship. From the benefits of being a part of the body of Christ while denying by your deeds what you say you believe. By the way, there can be no real fellowship with someone who has hard-heartedly rejected all that a believer holds dear. I mean, what kind of a conversation do you have with someone whose hard heart you've addressed, whose hard heart you and several others have addressed, whose hard heart the entire church has addressed, and he still wants to be your friend? What is there left to talk about? Your friend is on a pathway to apostasy. He is walking away from everything you hold dear and everything that defines our relationships together. The unrepentant one has successively removed layers of the church from his own life. And this is what sin does. Sin is isolating. You have to remove yourself from relationships to hold on to sin. And you're willing to break those relationships because you love sin more. I'll read to you a paragraph from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together. He says, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him, and the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. And this can happen even in the midst of a pious community. In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusion of the heart. 
The sin must be brought into the light. The unexpressed must be openly spoken and acknowledged. All that is secret and hidden is made manifest. It is a hard struggle until the sin is openly admitted. But God breaks gates of brass and bars of iron. Psalm 107, 16. Does the person whose sin is being addressed like the procedure? Not often. Do you like to be woken up in the middle of a deep sleep? When your house is on fire? Do people complain about the process? Yes. You didn't have to use cold water to get me out of bed, but your house was on fire. I hope you see the wisdom and love of Jesus in the simple, clear procedure he has given to his, to his followers. To not follow this procedure is unbiblical. There are lots of unbiblical ways to respond to sin in the church. Indifference, condescension, judgmentalism, self-righteousness, cowardice. False love, a kind of sentimentality, a mantra that says don't meddle in personal business, vindictiveness, revenge, deflecting from our own sin by pointing out other people's sin, hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of the church telling the world it needs to repent, but the church itself won't repent. The neglect of this duty is not love any more than neglecting the discipline of your own children would be love. Given the danger of sin and the trajectory that sin puts one on, one has said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you are willing to pay. And so the loving thing to do is to help a brother or sister become disentangled from the deception and death that sin Bring. The unstated step five of church discipline is a welcoming back into the church of a restored brother or sister. Some of you have experienced that in the context of the local church. This is something we pray for and long for in those with whom we've been in this process already. There is something of a Matthew 18 sandwich. The Matthew 18 process sits in a chapter called Matthew 18. And uh, Scott Maxwell preached a sermon detailing this Matthew 18 conglomeration. Verses 1 to 5, we are to have humble faith like a child to get in. Verses 6 through 10, stumbling blocks are to be removed that cause God's children to sin. 12 to 14, there is the pursuit of prodigal sheep. Verses 15 to 20 is the discipline process, and the whole rest of the chapter is about forgiveness over personal offenses. What is on display in all of chapter 18, humility, purity, love, discipline, forgiveness, they all go together in the plan that Jesus has laid out. There's another participant in this process besides the church. The second participant is heaven itself. We see heaven's endorsement in verse 18. Jesus says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. There is a window into heaven for disciples who grow weary in doing good. I mean, who wants to call a brother an outsider? Who has the stomach for treating someone you love as a tax collector? But this is God's good process. And I'm so thankful that we have this window from heaven shining down with heaven's endorsement on this very difficult process. The Holman Christian Standard Bible and the New American Standard represent accurately a very strange verb tense. 
shall have been bound, shall have been loosed. If you're a grammar nerd, this is a future perfect. We don't use it very often. If my trash is overflowing at home right now, I shall have taken out the trash is a good promise to make. It's better if you fulfill it. It means in the future, I will do something that will have lasting effects into the further future. What's described here is something has already been done when we do this process. That heaven already knows the condition of the heart of the one in this process. And what we discover by following these simple procedures is what heaven already knows. And it's really a remarkable process in that regard. What we do here in this process does not bend heaven's will to our process. Rather, the process, when carried out according to Jesus' instructions, simply reveals here what heaven already knows. It effectively reveals what only heaven could know, the condition of a human heart. Proverbs gives this instruction, Do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe His reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. And God's relationship to the church is the relationship of the love of a father to a son. God's relationship to his individual children by adoption is a relationship of love. And that relationship comes with reproof. This is the Lord's process for the Lord's people. And knowing this gives great comfort to the church when we follow Jesus' instructions. There is a third party to this procedure, a third party to the church and to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We we see the promise of Jesus' presence in verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, again, I say to you that if two two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. It's not helpful when we remove verses 19 and 20 out of this chapter, out of its context, to endorse a a private prayer meeting. Uh, Maybe with the assumption that Jesus is present only if there's two or three there, or that there's a guarantee of his presence if two or three people are praying. That's not the idea of this verse. Jesus is omnipresent. He's always everywhere. And he's with you when you're praying alone. What's described here is the proximity of Jesus to this Matthew 18 process. His his personal endorsement along with heaven's endorsement of what is going on in this process. His special presence is on display here. Just as he promised the disciples that he would be with them even to the end of the age in Matthew 28 and the Great Commission as they take the gospel to the ends of the earth, so he would be with him in this very difficult process called church discipline. This is critical comfort for the two or three who need to be involved in the difficult process. Jesus is with you in this. And this is critical for the church when an announcement needs to be made and instructions are given. Jesus is with you in this. Can you imagine what it would have been like if if you had to speak to Ananias or Sapphira? Listen, they, they loved the applause that Barnabas got. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, sold a piece of property he had and gave 100% of the proceeds and laid them at the apostles' feet for the disbursement, for the needs of gospel progress and for the needs of the church. And everybody said, wow, Barnabas. And Ananias and Sapphira had some property too. And it was theirs to do with as they wished. There was no command from the Lord to sell the whole thing. There was no command to sell it at all. And they sold it freely. And they could have said, you know, we want to give 17% of the proceeds to the needs of the church. And there could have been rejoicing. But they wanted people to esteem them the way they had esteemed Barnabas. And so lying to the Holy Spirit and lying to men, they let everybody believe that they gave 100% of the proceeds. 
and God took their lives. Could you imagine if, if God had not done his own version of church discipline and it was your job to go talk to Ananias and Sapphira, what would that conversation be like? Hey, I, I, th- I saw the deed of sale. I, I didn't want to. I, I just, I work in the local jurisdiction office and saw it. Did, did, did you lie? And, and, and what if they cover it up with more lies? And, and, and this is your brother, and, and, and you're proud of your brother. I mean, it, it's hard to be a Christian in these days and then to just give freely your belongings, and yet there's this unchecked sin, and now you're in a position to address it, and you've got to take others with you. It's hard. It's good to know that Jesus is with believers in this process. If Ananias and Sapphira's sin had not been addressed, this compromises the church's integrity. It cripples the church's witness. Any sin that just goes undealt with, especially those sins that become widely known in the church and in the world, they, they cripple the church's witness. They dishonor the church's Lord. They, it fails to love the church's people to leave them unaddressed. There is on Grace Bible Church's website a series of messages on this topic. At various times, we've uh, had to address people through this process and have desired to teach the church how to go through this. And from a number of different angles, from a number of different passages, you can learn more about this by listening to those messages on the website. Additionally, if you have questions about this process, we would encourage you to ask any of the pastors, any of the elders, the shepherds at Grace Bible Church. And if you find yourself in a situation where you want help in your part of this process, we would encourage you, please speak to one of the elders. Let me close us in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We do not naturally think the way that you think. And we're thankful that you have revealed your mind to us. We thank you for this good and serious, sobering text and the procedures it outlines for loving one another well, caring for one another well. We pray that we would have your heart in these things, that we would surrender ourselves under your lordship and follow your instructions with humble faith and love one another in humble, simple obedience. Let us do so with compassion, with grace, looking to our own hearts. And God, we just confess to you our own sins, the sins we know about, the sins we aren't aware of yet. And we ask that you would be pleased to make us like your son, to make us effective in this world for witness of what your son has done, to bring the light of the gospel to a watching world, to a needy world, to a desperate world. And we pray that you'd be pleased to do that here in Tempe and in the East Valley and to the ends of the earth. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.